So thanks very much, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today, um, enjoying the conference and, and all the presentations so far. And also, I wanted to thank them especially for inviting my daughter to join me here as well, who's um, sitting uh, near the front. So um, I'm a working scientist, um, and most of what I do in my day job has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk to you about, except that um, there's an intersection between alternative medicine and, and my efforts, which are to try to push the, the boundaries of of scientific research, mostly on the basic science side, but I'm not going to tell you about that today. Um, I am involved some in, in education of medical students at Johns Hopkins. Uh, most of the students that I teach, uh, what I'm teaching are, uh, are students in the basic science programs in, in biomedical engineering and computer science, um, but I do, do, I do one lecture a year to the medical students on alternative medicine, and this is um, how this particular presentation sort of evolved. So. Um, I'm going to try to address in, in 45 minutes or so um, four questions today. First, uh, although many of you probably are familiar with it, I'm going to just say a little bit about what alternative medicine is, uh, and I'm going to talk some about what medical schools uh, are teaching it uh, and where the support for it's coming uh, from and, and whether, whether or not it's growing, and, and then also talk about whether it works, which I, I think um, you might guess what I think the answer to that will be. But um, so. Uh, CAM, or Complementary and Alternative Medicine, is, is now, I, I just checked this a week ago, there's an organization that, that says it represents 60 major medical centers, hospitals, and medical schools around the U.S. Um, that's part of this uh, consortium, on, now called Integrated Medicine and Health. So I should say a little bit about um, what alternative medicine is right now. So I'm going to call it CAM, just for shorthand, which stands for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Alternative medicine is really just a marketing phrase. It doesn't have a technical meaning, so you can use it to mean almost anything you like, and it's used to mean a lot of different things. And in fact, the phrase itself has undergone a, uh, a sort of evolution since the 80s when it used to be called holistic medicine. And then it, uh, uh, as people sort of figure out that that didn't work or it fell out of favor, they changed the, uh, the people promoting it changed the, the name to alternative medicine. And then they uh, adopted complementary medicine in, in implying that you use this together with real medicine. Uh, and then in, in recent years, in the last um, 10 years or so, um, alternative medicine has also kind of people sort of figured out that that doesn't work. So now the popular phrase is integrative medicine. So I might use that phrase as well, especially towards the end. So when you look at major medical schools, you can find that um, today a surprising number of them do in fact offer um, education and uh, uh, clinical treatment in uh, alternative medicine. Although today, if you look, you'll see most of them talking about integrative medicine because they've quickly adopted this new phrase. So here are a few of the, of the topics that you can find offered. And you'll see that um, these are, I got these off of the Georgetown Medical School and the U Michigan Medical School website. Uh, and you'll see things like, um, in, like traditional Chinese medicine, uh, which includes a variety of things. Um, of herbs and, and traditional practices from China, Ayurveda, homeopathy, naturopathy. Uh, there's different categories, so mind-body uh, medicine, um, manual therapies, which includes chiropractic, um, and energy-based therapies, which includes acupuncture. And you look at these two lists, by the way, they look almost the same. In other medical schools, you can find similar lists, and that's because they actually came from the same source, which was a, a site at NIH, which defined what topics uh, alternative medicine would include. So. This is really a grab bag of very different things. You can't really make a sweeping statement about alternative medicine as much as I would like to. Uh, and one clever thing about the way alternative medicine or integrative medicine has been marketed is that it includes some modalities that are, that are perfectly reasonable. And I would include in that things like, say, meditation or massage or just relaxation techniques, which are not crazy and, in fact, might be beneficial to some people for some conditions. So if you say all alternative medicine is, is, is ineffective or is bad, then that would be inaccurate, so you can't really say that. Um, and when I talk to the medical school students, I tell them the same thing, that alternative medicine, they might hear about it as a phrase like, this is something we should do, and it's not really meaningful, especially as a scientist, it's not meaningful to make such a broad and sweeping statement. So let's just look at, I'll just look at two of these many different topics, and each of these, in fact, I could spend my whole time on, but I won't. Uh, and you may be familiar with, with both of these, but I'll, I'll uh, bear with me if you already know what these things are. So um, I'll start with homeopathy, and then I'll talk a little about acupuncture. So homeopathy is, is um, one of my uh, sort of favorite uh, examples of alternative medicine, because it's probably the easiest one to debunk. So homeopathy was invented uh, pretty much out of whole cloth by Samuel Hahnemann over 200 years ago in the late 1700s. 
And, and it, in his defense, uh, he didn't. Uh, nobody really knew that much about um, how how uh, how medicine worked or how science worked in those days. A lot of principles of, of biology and chemistry hadn't been worked out yet. Um, so homeopathy is based on two principles, both of them uh, generally wrong. One is that like cures like, and that's the idea that if someone is showing some symptoms, you give them a treatment which, which causes the same symptoms, and that will tend to make them better. Um, there wasn't really any evidence for that, but anyway, that's the principle that he proposed. Uh, and the other, the other notion, which is even in some ways even more wrongheaded, is that diluting a substance will make it more potent. And so he, he had the idea that if you dilute things um, nearly infinitely, that they'll become even more incredibly uh, um, effective and potent. Um, and that fact is just the opposite of what's true. Now, now today we know, and we've known for a couple hundred years, that there's a limited number of molecules in a solution of a substance. And if you dilute things down too much, there won't even be a single molecule left. But, um, and in fact, that principle, which led to Avogadro's number, was known at the time that Hahnemann proposed homeopathy. But Hahnemann probably didn't know about it, because information traveled slowly, and it was a really new discovery at, at that time. So, so there's no scientific evidence behind this, but, but despite that, 200 years later, homeopathy is still quite popular. So just to give you a quick example of the, of the, sort of, of the extent to which they dilute substances, a typical homeopathic preparation is diluted to something called 30C. Uh, C means 1 one hundredth dilution, and 30C doesn't mean 30 times 100, it means 100 to the 30th power. So it means you dilute something to, if, by a factor of 100, and you do that again 30 times. And if you really did that and, and, and did it exactly right, then a pill that would have uh, one molecule of a substance would have to be, uh, well, the pill itself would have to have a diameter equivalent to the distance between the Earth and the Sun for it to have even one molecule. So essentially 30C means you're just looking at, at water at that point. So nonetheless, you can buy um, homeopathic preparations today. You could walk to your, let me give a couple of examples that um, uh, I just looked up just recently, so these are still uh, very popular. So um, acylococcinium is something that uh, you'll see in your local pharmacy every flu season. It's promoted quite heavily. Um, here's a picture of the package, and you see across the top it says flu-like symptoms in large letters. Uh, and in, in this red circle it says reducing, and reduces duration and severity of flu symptoms. Um, so you would see this in your local Rite Aid or whatever pharmacy you prefer, and you would be, uh, it would be reasonable to assume that there must be something to that. How could they put out a package that has that uh, in large type on the front of it and it's when, it, when it's not true. But in fact, it's not true at all. There's no evidence whatsoever uh, that acylococcinium does anything for the flu. Um, one reason I like to talk about this is that I've done research on the flu, but again, I'm not talking about my research. Um, so it has no, no effect at all on the flu virus. These, pill, these pills are just sugar pills, and they're not that cheap either. Um, the only thing that's really accurate on this package is um, the claims that it has that it's non-drowsy and there's no drug interactions and it's safe, <laughs> so that's that's all true. Um, but it's th this and all other homeopathic preparations are, are not regulated by by the government, so they can make um, certain claims as long as they don't step over the line. I think these claims on this package, this is a current package, I think they do step over the line. But what happens is every now and then the FDA will write them a stern letter saying you need to tone those down, and then they'll change the packaging a little bit. Um, if you look. There actually has been studies. Um, there was a, a Cochrane review of, uh, uh, of, uh, home, of acylococcinum itself uh, just a couple of years ago, and it showed there was no statistically significant difference between the effects of this particular pill and, and in, in placebo and prevention of flu. And it would have been quite shocking if there had been. Um, let me give you one other quick example of a homeopathic preparation. Um, this is one I blogged about a couple of years ago. Um, there's something called ColdCom, made by the same people who make uh, oxylococcinium, and it has a whole raft of ingredients in it. It was sold as, uh, as, a, as a treatment for the flu, sorry, for, for the common cold, and they have a child's version as well. Um, so here's the ingredients. I don't expect you to read all these, but if you just look at, um, at say, one of them, Nux Vomica 3C. So what that is, that's actually strychnine. And 3C is not really that dilute. That's a 1 100 dilution um, uh, threefold. So there might actually be some strychnine in these pills. Probably not, but there might actually be some. And if you, it doesn't take much work to find warnings. Here's a warning from the American Cancer Society saying that, that this particular, that strychnose nux vomica has not been proven effective for the treatment of any illness. That would include the flu. And there's a warning that because the seeds contain strychnine, you really shouldn't be giving this to your children. Nonetheless, it's, um, it's, on your, it's in your pharmacy, um, uh, I would wager, in most of your pharmacies today if you go and look for it. 
Um, and I would say even, uh, so homeopathy is so implausible that even the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, or NCAM, about which I'll have more to say a little later, uh, no longer supports it. So if, this is a, a, an institute or center at NIH um, that does generally support research on alternative medicine. And their website used to be very wishy-washy about homeopathy, but after a lot of complaints from uh, skeptics and uh, skeptical doctors, um, at least I hope that was why, um, they, they modified their website to make it more clear that there's, there's little evidence, as they say here, to support homeopathy as an effective treatment for any specific condition. And they also point out that the concepts of homeopathy are inconsistent with fundamental concepts of chemistry and physics, which is about as, as damning as you can expect from, uh, from NIH. And yet, if you, this is from last year, here's a, a story I saw on CNN, um, how to avoid digital eye strain from staring at your computer screen too long. And they listed a number of, of treatments. Some of them were reasonable, but uh, included in that list was homeopathy. And they, in fact, have a specific recommendation for a remedy called Ruta Graviolans, which doesn't do anything to affect eye strain, I can tell you that. It's an ornamental plant that actually is, has some toxic uh, ingredients in it. So that's, one of the, that's just one example of homeopathy. Um, now let me talk about acupuncture just for a couple minutes. So acupuncture is a big one. It's probably the most of the, of the alternative modalities. It's probably the most widely taught in medical schools, at least in looking around at the various um, other medical schools' websites and, and, and academic programs. They, they all seem to offer something about acupuncture. And a lot of medical schools have acupuncturists um, on the staff. So, um, so I'll say what it is. You probably all know, but let me just um, make sure we're all on the same page. So it's a, essentially a pre-scientific superstition based on something called chi, um, which is a, a, a life force of vital energy that supposedly flows through the body on invisible lines called meridians. Um, there isn't really any plausible mechanism in, in, in real physiology for this, because we don't know of any, any such life force. There's no evidence that there is anything like this. Um, but the idea is that you'll, you'll stick needles into the body along these meridians and manipulate that, that life force or energy and make people feel better. Um, acupuncturists themselves don't actually agree on where the points are, uh, the acupuncture points are, or the meridians are, um, and um, more importantly, experiments show that it doesn't work. But it, it is an actual manipulation. So unlike homeopathy, where you're giving somebody um, a pill which we can demonstrably show has nothing in it, so there's no way it could work. With acupuncture, you're sticking needles into someone's body, so there is a physiological reaction for sure. Something is happening. And, and who knows, you know, it's not Im completely impossible that in certain places if you stick a needle, it might make people feel better in some ways. Um, I'll have more to say about that in just a second. So, so many medical schools, including, I, I have to reluctantly admit, occasionally Johns Hopkins Medicine, are teaching students that acupuncture works. And by the way, when I talk to students about, uh, when I give my annual uh, lecture now about alternative medicine, I talk about acupuncture, and I've been surprised to find that, that a number of students are quite offended at, at the points I just made on the previous slide. They're offended when I, when I critique those points and say there's no evidence for them. So, um, and that to me was sort of disappointing to discover this. And I get this in the, uh, directly in questions after my lecture and then in student feedback later after that. So the question is, does it work, right? So it's not completely implausible. It's not based on um, a body of evidence, but it has in, in the past few decades been studied extensively. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of studies of acupuncture. Um, so in fact, once, once there's uh, been enough studies around, people start writing reviews. So in the scientific community, we write review, let, review, review articles all the time where you go and read the latest research on a particular topic, and you write a paper describing, sort of summarizing what that research says. Um, here's, uh, and if there's enough reviews, you can review those. So here's a, a, a review of reviews by Ed Zardernst and his colleagues from a couple years ago on acupuncture asking, does it alleviate pain? And by the way, it's, it's, um, its proponents claim it does many things. Alleviating pain is probably one of the most popular claims for it. Um, their conclusion, and you see here, um, I uh, quoted it here, in, in conclusion of the, the review of reviews, found that um, there, uh, all the different reviews generated little truly convincing evidence that acupuncture is effective in reducing pain, um, and serious adverse effects continue to be reported. So now and then, acupuncturists will do something with the needles which is, is damaging to the patients. Um, for example, um, they don't all practice proper sterile techniques, and sometimes patients get it, develop infections because, again, you're, you're puncturing their skin with a, with a needle. So let me say a little bit about, so there are some positive studies uh, uh, of acupuncture where they, they report there is an effect. So let me say a little bit about um, placebo effects. I'm going to look at one study in a little more detail to give you a little more context. So um, 
So you probably all heard of placebo effects. So the, the, the fact is that many patients experience some subjective benefit from almost any treatment. And this is why we do, uh, so I should say this, is a, this can be a real benefit. Um, you can really feel better um, without having any treatment at all, with just having a sham treatment of some kind. Now, um, uh, and sort of to give an example, so you're, you can convince yourself you're feeling less pain, or you can convince yourself that, that various physiological uh, uh, um, components of your own health are, are different. Um, so your, your mind really can control your body. We, no, there's no doubt about that. You can sit in a dark room and increase your heart rate. And if you don't believe that, go and watch a scary movie, and you'll see what I mean. So uh, that's obviously you're just sitting there, and something you're processing is changing your physiological uh, uh, function. So the fact that there's, a real, that there's a placebo effect and that it's a real effect does not mean that a treatment works. This is a very important principle in scientific research, and that's why we do placebo controls. So uh, a placebo control is when you run a study, you're testing some treatment, and you compare it to doing nothing, but you want to do nothing in such a way that the patient thinks that he or she is getting something. So that controls for this. If you do it right, that can control for the placebo effect. And in order for us to conclude that a, real, that a medicine works, that it's real medicine, it has to work better than placebo. Not better than nothing, but better than placebo. So that's sort of the acid test that prove a therapy works. We can't always do that. You can't always design an experiment to uh, properly do that. But over time, people have actually worked hard to um, try to come up with placebo acupuncture studies. It's difficult because you, you need to have a patient convinced that, that he or she is being stuck with needles. Um, but there are uh, clever devices that don't quite pierce the skin that, that make the patients think that. And if you really want to do it properly, you also want to uh, blind the experimenter. That is, the person administering the acupuncture, need, uh, if, if that person knows that they're not doing real acupuncture, they can subtly uh, transmit that to the patient, and that can affect the effect as well. So, um, so here's a, a, a meta-analysis that appeared a couple years ago that got a lot of attention. Uh, uh, acupuncture for chronic pain. So this had a different conclusion from the Ed Sardernst paper. Um, this, uh, was a, a, this was not a review, but a meta-analysis. Now there's a difference, an important difference here. A meta-analysis takes a bunch of other studies. It doesn't just review them and summarize them, but actually takes the data from those and, and pools it together and reanalyzes it. And if done properly in, at least theoretically, this can be better than once, can be more powerful because you have more subjects, more data. Um, on the other hand, uh, meta-analysis is, is um, um, very much prone to cherry-picking. So depending on what data you choose to pool, you can manipulate, even unconsciously manipulate, the results. Uh, uh, so meta-analyses, uh, you should always read with a grain of salt. They're not usually as good as a, as a, a, a well-done, uh, well-designed study. So you don't do a, a meta-analysis is not a new study. It is a collection of other studies, but a reanalysis of the data. So this, um, this paper, which was led by, by Vickers, uh, concluded that acupuncture is effective for the treatment of chronic pain and is therefore a reasonable referral option. So that's the message to doctors. Significant differences between true and sham acupuncture indicate that acupuncture is more than a placebo. However, these differences are relatively modest. So, so this was, was big news to acupuncturists. And this is despite the fact that there are many studies prior to this saying it doesn't work. Um, here's a story from Time magazine right after that. Um, study appeared, it was written up in Time, it was written up in the New York Times and other places, saying, look, oh look, acupuncture may offer real relief from chronic pain. So, um, and I use this example with the medical school students to try to teach them um, to be skeptics, to be scientific thinkers, critical thinkers, and it, which is a challenging thing to do. Um, the problem is that you have to, to, to understand, so what happened with the Vickers analysis, to, that you have to look at the studies that they looked at which means you not only have to read the Vickers paper, you have to go and look at the papers they read and pull out the data from those papers, and that takes a lot of time. Most people don't want to do that. Most doctors don't want to do that. The best you're going to get from most doctors, and you don't even get this most of the time, is that they'll at least keep up with the literature and read those abstracts, those summaries, uh, and they'll, so they'll know what the latest literature says. And if you just read the summary, what I just showed you about the Vickers study, that's what you'd think, that, oh, now there's evidence that acupuncture works. So here's one of the studies that, um, uh, that Vickers used, the data that, uh, which has the data that they then reanalyzed. And this was on acupuncture for knee osteoarthritis. Um, and it was a randomized trial with three arms. Um, and this was published in 2006, a few years before the Vickers study. So, so I read this paper um, to figure out what, uh, what the real data was. So here they had 1,000 patients, just over 1,000 patients. And they had three groups, an acupuncture group, a sham acupuncture group where they they stuck in the needles, but only to a minimal depth, not as deep as you're supposed to, and at a random location, but it was sort of near the location where an acupuncturist told them to, uh, the, the needle was supposed to go, but not, not exactly the right position. 
Uh, and then there was a third, essentially, no treatment group. With the, uh, you had physician visits, but no acupuncture. So there was acupuncture, sham acupuncture, and, and nothing. Um, and then they measured um, improvement or in pain by a questionnaire. And this is, brings up another issue. When you're studying pain, it is inherently subjective. You have to simply ask the patient, how's that pain feeling now? And so that is extremely uh, subjective to, to uh, um, various other effects, such as the expectations of the experimenter, which is why you need a very carefully controlled study to measure pain. So that, anyway, their results were, and they had, a, 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 based on this questionnaire, they had a, an objective way of, of defining what a success was, uh, given the, that the questionnaire was sub subjective. So 29% of the people said they had uh, reduction in pain with no treatment. 53% um, said there was a reduction in pain with acupuncture, and 51% with sham acupuncture. So it's, and it should be pretty obvious, the 53% and 51% are essentially the same number. So there's no real difference between those two. So both groups that got acupuncture or sham acupuncture, both of those did better um, than, than no treatment at all. Um, now, there were some problems with this study, and even though, remember, Vickers used this data, but the investigators were not blinded to the treatment group. So the ones who were doing the sham acupuncture knew that it was sham acupuncture. Um, uh, but still, at least it was an attempt to try to control for, for that. So here's what this study concluded. Um, it said that both um, TCA, that's traditional Chinese acupuncture, and sham acupuncture improved pain and functionality. Um, and they were surprised, and there's a, here this quote is, surprisingly no differences were observed between the TCA and sham acupuncture groups. Now, they shouldn't have been surprised, if you ask me, but th this did not show, in contrast to what Vickers is claiming, this did not show that sham acupuncture um, was not as good as real acupuncture. It showed that they were essentially the same. And they also point out that studies of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs usually report higher success rates. So I looked those up as well and found that if you just give people ibuprofen, you find success rates um, using same exact questionnaire as high as 84%. And remember, these, this study found a success rate of about 50%. So basically, my conclusion after reading this was that ibuprofen works as well or better than the, the placebo effect you get from acupuncture. So there's no reason to use acupuncture. Uh, Vickers didn't conclude the same thing. All right, so anyway, I, I'm not, I don't want to spend the whole talk um, just telling you about what alternative medicine is, but I wanted to give you a couple of examples. So let's, talk, let's look at what, what's going on in medical schools now. Um, so here's, um, just to pick on another medical school, here's acupuncture at Duke Medical School. You can go to their websites and find statements without any references. This is straight off of, their, of the Duke website saying, acupuncture is recommended for a wide variety of conditions such as acid reflux, insomnia, and fibromyalgia. Research shows strong results in easing conditions such as osteoarthritis, fertility, chemotherapy-related nausea, et cetera. So, and you can find statements like this on many other websites, and Duke is a, an excellent medical school. So what, so what, um, and that was, I just, just looked at that again last week, that statement is still there. So I decided, to, in order to try to summarize things, there's a lot of medical schools in the country. So let me just, uh, I decided I would look just at the top five medical schools and see what I could find about what they're doing today about um, practicing CAM. Now we can argue a lot about, in, in, in academia we love to argue about who's the top uh, medical school. At Hopkins, if you go around asking who's the top medical school, they'll say Hopkins is the top medical school. Um, so this is the U.S. News ranking, which m m everybody loves to hate, but everybody uses. So here's the top five medical schools in the latest U.S. News ranking of medical schools. And this is medical schools by research. It's also a separate rating for um, uh, uh, medical schools that uh, are more focused on, on clinical practice than on research. So Harvard, Stanford, Hopkins, UC San Francisco, and U University of Pennsylvania. So at Harvard, um, it's not hard at all to find their um, alternative medicine. There it's the, the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, headed by a guy named Ted Kapchuk. Um, and this is a well-funded center that offers fellowships. There's a research fellowship in integrative medicine you can get, which will um, uh, uh, fund you for three years to study uh, what they're calling now integrative medicine, but it's the same as it's always been, which includes mind-body therapies, placebo studies, and other things. Um, I'm just going to go through these five schools very quickly, so I don't want to say more about that, but um, if you want to know more about that, there's, there's a very interesting series of articles on science-based medicine about uh, Ted Kapchuk, who's the director of that program, or the co-director of that program at Harvard, um, called Dummy Medicine, Dummy Doctors, and a Dummy Degree. Um, so I, I think that title sort of says what that series kind of concludes. But anyway, that, that's Harvard, which is our number one medical school. 
Um, Stanford, I didn't have time to go and look at uh, as much as what they're actually offering, but they have a Center for Integrative Medicine, which offers all the same, same sort of buzzwords and, and topics that the other schools do. Um, Hopkins is on the list, and if you, if you Google it and look around, it, there's, there's one place you can find the Integrative Medicine, Medicine and Digestive, Digestive Center. Um, now, I'm at Hopkins, so I, I, I know the people who supposedly um, are the head of the division where this center, this is not for the whole school, where this center supposedly resides, so I wrote to the division director to say, what is this? So it's actually a small off-campus clinic. It's not at our main campus at all. And most people haven't even heard of it, but it is, it is featured on alternative medicine websites, and that, that integrative medicine collective links directly to this site. Um, if you go to the main Hopkins site, you would have a lot of trouble finding this, this site. But anyway, I personally have tried to get this off of the Hopkins website, and I'm met with sort of blank stares. It's like, well, well why? Why should we bother them? So there's sort of a uh, we don't really care attitude uh, about this at Hopkins, unfortunately. Um, at UC San Francisco, um, they have another OSHERS. So OSHERS have uh, funded uh, the Harvard Center and the UC San Francisco Center. And uh, you can see from this image from their uh, homepage that they, obviously they, uh, those are acupuncture points on those, on those feet there in that picture. Um, so they offer acupuncture and other things. Um, if you want to know more about that, I recommend uh, you can go and look at the blog that was written by ORAC a couple years ago on quackademic medicine at UC San Francisco and when they got a very large new building um, at, at UCSF and ORAC. Um, some of you might know as David Gorski, he's here in the audience. Um, if you didn't know that ORAC was David Gorski, then I just outed him. But um, I think it's a very well-known, he's a very well-known uh, uh, pseudonym as ORAC. Um, and of course, David is also the, the director of the Science-Based Medicine uh, website. And then the fifth school was University of Pennsylvania, um, and their uh, integrative medicine center seems to be in their cancer center, uh, where they offer all sorts of things. Um, so I picked on acupuncture again. They offer other things besides acupuncture, but here's some things about their acupuncture services, um, and they again have a little about acupuncture uh, description, which gives you some, uh, unfortunately, some misinformation about acupuncture saying, well, some non-misinformation say well, it originated in China, then they claim it goes back 2,500 years, um, which probably isn't true. Um, but then they also say that it's effective in a variety of conditions, and including um, treatment of, of uh, uh, the uh, side effects of chemotherapy. Um, and they even boast that the pen difference is that, um, that, they, that they integrate acupuncture into conventional cancer therapy. Um, which would be great if it worked, and as you do say, so here's a, a just a, in larger print some, something from their site, that it can enhance general quality of life by reducing the side effects of cancer and cancer treatments. And there have been studies, I should say, there have been studies looking at exactly that question, does acupuncture reduce the side effects of chemotherapy? And there have been studies that said, yeah, it seems like it might help, but those are bad studies. So as a scientist, I can tell you that the literature is filled with both good and bad studies, and in, some, in the case of uh, acupuncture, most of the studies are bad, and you have to read them with a really critical eye to figure out whether they were really properly controlled or not. So most of the studies of acupuncture that were done were done not surprisingly by proponents of acupuncture who really wanted to prove that it worked, and that's why you have to read them skeptically. All right, so clearly, though, integrative medicine is mainstream. I looked at the top five. I'm sure if I looked at the next five medical schools, I would find something about alternative medicine or integrative medicine at all of them. Um, probably I could go through the top 50, and almost all of them would have something. I was hoping Hopkins wouldn't have anything, but I'm still working on that. Um, so, so where did this all come from? Why are our top medical schools, which some of which, at least we hope that all of them, are basing their treatments on the latest research and on, on good science, why are they offering a variety of modalities, some of which are, uh, uh, are based on, on weeks or weak or, or, outright, or downright bad science? So I would say it all started with Senator Tom Harkin, now retired Senator Tom. He just retired in uh, December. So Harkin decided back in the late 1980s that bee pollen cured his hay fever. And it's very unlikely that it did, but he decided that it did. Um, and uh, he's been a sen he was a senator for decades, and he, and he said, hey, how come NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is not studying more of these things? And now I should say that NIH was studying those things. NIH will 
fund any kind of medical study that you like as long as you have a, a reasonable hypothesis, a good hypothesis, and a good plan for how you're, how you're going to study that. Now, that being said, it is extremely difficult to get NIH funding. The current success rate hovers between 10 and 15 percent, so most proposals to do research sent to NIH are rejected because there isn't that much money to go around. Um, and there's plenty of good proposals that are rejected every year, but if you have a good enough idea that, say, and you want to prove that bee pollen works to, to cure hay fever, you can study it. Um, but Harkin wasn't satisfied with, with that, so instead he said, let's have a set aside, an earmark of $2 million to create a new office of alternative medicine. So senators can do these things. Um, uh, earmarks have become sort of uh, a, a bad word in, in recent years, um, and for a while Congress was saying they wouldn't do them anymore, but um, they just found other ways to do them. They still do them all the time. Um, so this was back um, almost 25 years ago. Harkin created the Office of Alternative Medicine. It was immediately criticized um, by a number of scientists, uh, including, here's a quote from the president of the American Physical Society, which is where physicists go, um, that th this office has bestowed the considerable prestige of NIH on a variety of highly dubious practices, some of which clearly violate basic laws of physics and more clearly resemble witchcraft, which is fairly harsh words. Um, and the New York Times called it Tom Harkin's folly. Well, Harkin got the last laugh because it, it's still around, okay, and that was 1991. So in fact, um, the NIH director in the mid-90s was Harold Varmus, who I think uh, was one of the best directors we've had at the NIH for many years. Varmus um, is a Nobel laureate who, st who got his Nobel for his work on cancer, um, actually left NIH, went back and became head of the National Cancer Institute, uh, which he just stepped down from. But he, he um, knew about this office, of course, as the head of NIH, and he tried to, uh, uh, he couldn't get rid of it because Harkin had earmarked the money for it, but he was trying to make its studies uh, more rigorous. Um, and um, you can read in, in Varmus's memoir a very interesting uh, chapter or section of a chapter where he describes how um, Harkin essentially called him on the carpet in his office and said, you either lay your hands off of, keep your hands off of this office, or you're going to be out of a job. And uh, in the next year, Harkin introduced a bill to rename the Office of Alternative Medicine, the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine. And in the NIH world, a national center has much bigger standing than an office. And it essentially takes it, at, it gives a director much less control over it. Uh, and, and then a year later, he increased the end in income budget to $50 million. So it had been $2 million in 1991. In 99, it jumped up. And so you can go, the, this is the federal government, so all this information is public. So here's a chart showing NCAM's funding um, starting back in 1992, 91, 92, when it was down at two or three million. Um, you can see in the late 90s it jumped up. That was when Harkin changed it to an office. And then it, it rapidly accelerated. Now, for those who weren't um, involved in the funding world like I am, back in the Around the year 2000, the NIH underwent a doubling of its budget, which everybody was very happy about, but that included NCAM also got a doubling of its budget. So that's why there was a steep rise. And then things leveled off um, starting around 2003 or so, when the budgets have been more or less flat in recent years. Um, and so you can see that NCAM today is getting over $120 million a year. And Harkin retired, but it's still getting $120 million a year. Um, and in fact, there's an office of cancer alternative medicine called Occam, uh, which has a budget of about the same size, so the number's really twice that. And in fact, if you go to the N NCAM website today, it's even worse than that, because uh, the total funding this past year was about $367 million for all sorts of alternative medicine, and that's because NCAM co-funds a lot of projects with other institutes, and then they ask other institutes, could you chip in some money? And if you add all that up, which NIH has, has done for us, you can go look it up, um, you see that, we're, uh, that we, the taxpayers, are, are paying quite a lot, uh, $367 million last year. Um, it's dropped a little in recent years, but that's because everything at NIH has dropped. Uh, and then in just the last um, uh, few months, uh, NCAM's name was just changed as of January to, and I can't pronounce this, NCCIH, I'll just have to say the, uh, the letters. That's the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So it took a couple of years, but they also have dropped the word alternative and now it's integrative. Uh, nothing has changed, it's just the name. Um, there is a press release uh, with the obligatory quote from the director of NIH, Francis Collins. It's a long quote from Francis Collins. It's just one sentence that I cherry-picked uh, uh, shamelessly. Um, this change by Congress reflects the importance of studying the approaches to health and wellness that the public is using, often without the benefit of rigorous scientific study, said Francis Collins. So um, Collins is, uh, I, I know Francis personally, he's a smart guy, but he's um, 
politician, all right? So honestly, the head of NIH has to be a politician. So he says what he thinks he needs to say. I don't actually think that's uh, very honorable, to be frank. But um, this, is, this statement is, is correct, and such as it is, um, but n not exactly. We have, in fact, done studies of pretty much uh, every one of the alternative modalities that I listed on that second or third slide. Um, in almost all cases, we found no benefit. Um, but it is true the public is still using them. However, scientifically, that's not a reason to study something, just because people are doing it. You don't have to study it. Certainly, you don't have to use what uh, most of us consider precious NIH dollars to study it. Um, so I think the, the name change was kind of a parting gift to Harkin. It would have been so much better if Harkin's retirement would coincide with, let's just get rid of this thing already. But now it's got a different name, and it, it may be here in perpetuity. So anyway, you see the budget's gone up over the past 25 years a lot. So um, in other areas of scientific funding, when budgets are going up, you usually you think there's some reason for that having to do with the science itself. Um, in the case of NCAM, I would like to argue that that's not true. Now, I can't give you, uh, I can't summarize thousands of studies for you, but um, here's an article from a few years ago where now and then the mainstream media get it right. So here's an article from NBC said, uh, pointing out that $2.5 billion has been spent. This is referring to NCAM's budget and the, and the cancer alternative medicine budget. Uh, and no alternative cures have been found. And that pretty much summarizes it, that there have been lots of studies. There have been some poorly done studies that have reported positive effects. Better done studies almost always report no benefit from acupuncture, from homeopathy, from Reiki, uh, from other forms of energy medicine, uh, from Ayurveda. So none of these things have been shown to work by the studies that NIH has funded, and yet the, the money is still being spent. Uh, and in fact, this was so obvious that Harkin had a hearing, Harkin and a couple other senators had a hearing a few years ago, 2009, um, and Harkin said, here's a quote from him, one of the purposes of this center, he called the center directors on the carpet, and he said, one of the purposes of the center was to investigate and validate alternative approaches. Quite frankly, I must say publicly that it has fallen short. And he, and he went on to lament that its, its focus seems to have been on disproving things rather than seeking out and approving things. Now, that, um, so, yeah, it's, I hear some of you are laughing. This is, not, this is not a scientific perspective on things, but it's a political perspective. Um, not really that surprising. It really shows um, a, a deep misunderstanding of, of science, I would argue. Um, and yet, we scientists, we rely on the government to fund most of our research. So, so scientists are very reluctant to criticize, have been reluctant to criticize Harkin. I've criticized him, and a few other bloggers have. I've talked to people in NIH about it, about, you know, why, why don't we uh, cr criticize Harkin for pushing this over and over again, especially after this 2009 hearing, which was kind of a, a, a farce. Um, and it, it turns out that over the years, Harkin was one of NIH's biggest champions inside the Senate. So he always pushed for NIH to get more funding for everything, and so people didn't want to bite the hand that feeds them. People at NIH and other, other people outside NIH who had a lot of NIH funding. Uh, I should say that I also have a, a fair amount of NIH funding myself, but um, I think I'm not a big enough fish for Harkin to notice. Um, but if someone within NIH were to criticize him, that, that could cause trouble. So the NIH director in particular uh, probably figured it was, it was not worth it to complain because then you might get, you, you never know what a politician is going to do. They might say, you're right, we'll, we'll cut that budget and we'll cut other things as well and we'll give all that money to somebody completely different, not to NIH. So um, that's, that's sort of politics. But it really does show that um, when politicians um, uh, get a little bit too, uh, when they meddle, I should say, a little bit too much or get, to, get into micromanaging science, um, their deep misunderstanding of science can, can uh, cause a lot of harm. So, so what about that bee pollen, by the way? So he did actually create this center 24 years ago to look into bee pollen, and it, it has been studied. Um, it doesn't work for allergies, um, and in fact, it sometimes uh, can cause severe allergic reactions. So here's a just one paper there, I found several. There's, here's one paper um, cited here showing that um, uh, bee pollen caused anaphylactic shock in an in a unknowing, unknowingly sensitized subject. So if you don't know that you're uh, really allergic to it, it can, it can be quite damaging. And it does not cure your allergies. Um, so let me, uh, I want to make like one or two other quick points. Um, so N NCAM's other mission besides funding research is training. In fact, that's always been a big part of its mission, and a significant amount of, of its budget goes towards training. And that's true for all the national centers and the institutes at, at NIH. They all fund training programs. Um, and here's uh, some excerpts from their website showing the kind of things that their training programs 
focus on. Um, this is actually, uh, this, this part of their website is for people who are interested in applying for funding to create a training program. Here's what you will do. You'll, you can train experts in CAM clinical practice, um, and you can train um, uh, young scientists on, on biomedical and behavioral research scientists on, uh, to gain expertise in, in CAM research, whatever, whatever you want to call CAM research. Um, so uh, the fact is that if you offer money, people will come. So I, I just, NIH grants are all, the information about NIH grants is all uh, publicly available if you know where to look on the NIH site. So just last week I looked to see, okay, who has training grant money from NCCIH, you know, formerly NCAM, and the current set of recipients in the current fiscal year are these um, universities and medical centers. And you see lots of names that, that I assume you all recognize, Wisconsin, Washington, Louisiana State, Cornell, Pittsburgh, and so on. Um, so all these places have um, training programs, and the, what's, what's odd to me about this is that NCAM and now NCCH, having training in its mission is kind of divorced from whether or not the methods are effective. So they're going to teach people about acupuncture whether or not it works. They're going to teach them about other kinds of alternative medicine, whether or not they work. Um, and there's something to me fundamentally wrong about that. You should be first figuring out whether they work then if it turns out they work, then perhaps you should train people in, in how to apply those methods. But that's not how N NCAM is operated. So uh, let me just conclude with a couple of things. So what do we do about this? So I've blogged about this topic a few times, and uh, so have another of other scientific bloggers, and that hasn't really worked, as you see. If you just look at the budget uh, for NCAM, um, they're um, uh, still funded at pretty much the same levels they were before. Um, so here, let me say a little bit, when, I, when I've taught the medical students at Hopkins, I thought, well, that's something on a very small scale. Maybe when, when I was asked to, to lecture to them on alternative medicine, I thought, well, maybe I can do a little bit, and by, I can do a little bit there. And by the way, the reason I was asked to lecture them is that our curriculum committee says we're supposed to be giving them a certain number of hours of education in alternative medicine. And I'm still trying to find out where that came from and how do I, like, tell them, no, you don't need to do that. But at least one of the uh, people, one of the professors running one of the courses thought, well, we can teach them about alternative medicine by teaching them that it doesn't work. That's okay, right? So that's why I invited me. Um, but what was really surprising to me was that the students uh, didn't want to hear that. So um, the students get, in the first two years in medical school, they get a huge number of lectures. They're memorizing lots of things. And they are not being trained to be critical thinkers. They're not being trained to be scientists. I, came in, I come in for like an hour to try to teach them that a little bit, and they don't really want to hear it. What they want to know is, what do I need to remember for the exams? You know, they've been, they got into medical school, they got into Hopkins Medical School, which is really hard to get into, by acing all their exams and all their classes as an undergraduate, and they're still in that mode of just like, you're the professor, tell me what I need to know, I'll write that down and go and study it, and I'll regurgitate it on the exam. And I'm up there saying, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to go and look at the literature and not remember it, but figure out whether it's right or not. And that's, that's really hard to do. Uh, and I was telling them that some of the things that some of them believed, uh, and acupuncture was one of them, some of them believe, I said, that's wrong. What, you're, what you currently believe is wrong, and you're going to go out and practice this on, on people, and it's not effective, and it could even be harmful. They didn't want to hear it. Um, so I was sort of uh, frustrated by that, but I'm going to keep trying. Um, so anyway, so what do we do about um, this uh, now fairly entrenched um, set of centers and, and programs and uh, integrative medicine um, uh, training programs? So um, I think we, uh, those of us who do are involved in education need to educate students more in critical thinking, not just memorizing things, not just accepting things, but questioning things um, that are told to them, asking where did that knowledge come from, what's it based on? Um, and uh, to break them out of a curriculum that emphasizes memorization and test taking. Um, and I would like to try to teach students, and this is not, a, you may be shocked to know that, to hear this, but it's not part of our medical curriculum today to teach students to go out and read the scientific literature. So I used to think when I was uh, much younger um, that doctors were scientists, the two were sort of equivalent, and many people do think that. Now, not to insult the doctors in the Arts Center, there's some here, there are some doctors who are scientists, who are well-trained scientifically and think like scientists and do a good job. But it's not, you don't have to be a scientist to be a doctor. You can go to medical school and do just fine without really learning critical thinking skills. You don't have to keep up with the scientific literature. You don't have to read it critically, and you can get your medical license and practice medicine. 
So we, but we should, I think, be teaching doctors. There's, I know there's a, the medical curriculum is very crowded, but we need to teach them to evaluate the literature critically. Uh, and then what we can do, what you and the audience can do is, uh, whenever you have the opportunity, try to educate the public. So CAM practitioners, who are part of the reason why NCAM continues to get funding, they are lobbying for it, they need customers. And the fact is that most of them are giving treatments that, that offer only a placebo benefit if, if there's any benefit at all. So uh, skeptical customers are going are to seek effective treatments uh, rather than ineffective ones. So if we can educate the public, then perhaps their market will, uh, will lessen. I, I don't, I'm not so naive as to think it will go away. Uh, and what can you do? So, uh, one, um, so I would say be prepared to answer the most common arguments in favor of CAM. So in my, in my blog, so I, I write at Forbes magazine. Um, I have a version of my blog, it's just on my own site too. But Forbes magazine, uh, many of you probably know, is a conservative venue. It's, it's mostly a business-oriented magazine, but they have a health and science uh, set of uh, bloggers. And that audience is not my, not the sort of people I usually interact with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's been very interesting to me because I get a lot of comments on my blog telling me what an idiot I am all the time. And uh, so I, I, you know, I don't mind that, but it tells me that I am reaching people who didn't agree with me. And I figure that for every comment that says that I'm an idiot, that I'm all wrong, I'm hoping there's, there's a few other people who actually didn't really, hadn't really thought about what I was writing about, didn't know about it, and those are the people who are, who are reachable. They haven't already made up their mind. So one very common argument um, uh, that I've heard time and time again uh, when I said this, uh, that we should stop funding NCAM, we should stop funding research in alternative medicine on, on all these modalities, is that more research is needed, like we still don't know. And, um, and another, uh, another, uh, another argument is that, well, what's the harm? Even if it's only placebo effect, placebo effect is good. So let me look just in the last like two minutes at, at, those, two, at those two points. So more research is needed. That's a pretty easy one to answer. After more than 20 years and more than two and a half billion dollars, NCAM has failed to show that any single new method works. That's a terrible track record. If you look at any other NIH institute, they've had success after success. Science is actually doing really, biomedical research is doing really well these days. So um, at some point, you have to be willing to say, it's time to move on. And we would have long ago said it was time to move on if this were not an earmark. And another thing to point out to people, just a sort of average person on the street, is that every dollar spent on CAM is a dollar that could have otherwise been spent on a real scheme, on real research. And there's a lot of real research right now that's not getting funded because funding is very tight. So in the answer to the question of what's the harm, um, I, I'm not going to give you any personal anecdotes about that because there's an excellent website that many of you have probably seen called whatstheharm.net. Um, that, that has uh, documents, many examples of harm caused by various types of pseudoscience, including alternative medicine, and documents all the numbers, uh, huge numbers of people, hundreds of thousands of people who've been killed over the years or injured over the years by, by beliefs in, in things that were, uh, that were not true. There's a, there's, a site, there's a part of this site dedicated to homeopathy. Here's a snapshot of it from a little while ago. And they have anecdotes there or examples there, such as here's um, a case uh, of a woman um, whose homeopath told her to give up her asthma medication and she died later of an asthma attack. Asthma is, not, is very treatable and manageable, but if you don't take your medicine, um, it can in occasion be fatal. And here's another example, there's many more, but this is a fairly, a very tragic one of um, uh, a very young child um, who was prescribed medications for her epilepsy but her parents consulted various alternative medicine practitioners, including an iridologist, an applied kinesiologist, uh, a psychic, and an osteopath. And she was only getting homeopathic medication when she died as a, a young child in 2002. So there's certainly harm. And the harm, uh, the greatest threat um, of alternative medicine in terms of personal harm is that people will use it instead of uh, real medicine. So I'm going to stop there. And maybe there's time for a couple of questions. If you're at all interested in my Real work, there's a link to my lab. That's nothing to do with what I talked about today. And here's a link to my Forbes blog. Thanks very much. Chip, chip, chip. We have time for one question. I'm, unfortunately, one question. Sorry. Sorry. About 20 years ago, this organization, through people like Stephen Barrett, took the position that chiropractic was an alternative method, uh, me uh, medicine that was ineffective and perhaps dangerous. I see it's not mentioned once. Is it no longer an alternative me medicine? Oh, um, 
can't remember if it was on that early slide I have, but chiropractic still is definitely considered an alternative medicine. In fact, I just blogged about it a couple months ago. So yeah, that's still considered, that's one of the things that NCAM uh, funds research on. Can I have one more? That was quick, we can do one more. Uh, Bill Clinton, after his quadruple bypass, became a vegetarian, actually a vegan. Is being a vegetarian considered an alternative form of medicine? medicine? Giving up all animal protein? So, so some people would say yes, and I can't say no because as I said at the beginning, alternative medicine is a sort of a marketing phrase. So it, it would be, it's, if I were being a proponent of alternative medicine, I would say absolutely yes, that a healthy diet is part of alternative medicine, uh, and therefore alternative medicine is good, right? But I think any physician would tell you that, uh, that a healthy diet is part of just regular medicine. You should eat, you should eat healthy food. So give up all animal protein. Oh, I'm not saying whether you should give up bottom. I'm not commenting on that particular diet, no. Uh, well, I was just right. going. Thank okay. you.